I'll be talking about stuff that is really at the other end of the spectrum in terms of technology and really a whole different population of users, folks who, who really don't have access to a lot of this kind of technology, which I use and love, some of the stuff from the previous presentation. Uh, just to give you a little bit of my own background, I, um, I started out when I was in college, I was very interested in computers. This was in the late 80s. Uh, computers were sort of just getting started on the personal computer sense. And um, I left college and went to work as a computer consultant doing database work on Wall Street. I worked for uh, what was then uh, Chase Manhattan Bank and what is now J.P. Morgan Chase. And after a couple years, I wound up going back to uh, school to become a doctor uh, for complicated reasons, which I, I'm not even sure I understand myself. And, uh, you know, that sort of, I, I sort of thought at that time, and that would have been, uh, the, again, the late 80s, maybe 87, 88, something like that. Um, I thought at that time, wow, you know, there, well, you know, that computer stuff was interesting, but I guess, you know, now I'm going to become a doctor and I'm leaving all that behind. And it's quite amazing to me because I, I've always been kind of a technophile, but it's interesting to me that, that I would possibly have been able to think talk about being clueless as to the context in which you are living, that I would possibly have thought to myself that someone who had uh, above average particular technical skills or computer skills, that one would, at that period of, of history, when, of course, this tidal wave of, of computerization, of personal computing was hitting our, our country and the world, that, that I could possibly have thought that I was leaving that behind. But it, in fact, it turned out to be a big detour because I, I did uh, go through, of course, medical training and residency it takes a long time. And then when I finished working, uh, when I finished my residency in pediatrics, I wound up working for the Centers for Disease Control. So CDC is part of the U.S. government. Uh, it's kind of the public health agency of the United States government. And uh, things that I observed while working, doing things like investigating outbreaks in Borneo and all sorts of interesting exotic uh, adventures like that, kind of led me to what I'm going to talk to you about today and the, the possible connection. It led me to bring back, bring together those two things that I was so interested in, public health and medicine and, and uh, technology. So the, the title of this talk, and I, I just added that outline uh, font there to emphasize the invisibility of it, uh, of this revolution I'm going to talk about. I'd like to talk to you about really, I think, as important a revolution in technology that's going on in developing countries right now. So. Uh, of course, I think everybody realizes, I, I'm pretty sure everybody in the room at least understands that cell phones are getting really popular every place. Of course, we've all lived through cell phones. You know, I mean, of course, we all remember a time, uh, everyone in this room remembers a time when no one here had a cell phone. Um, and everyone understands that now, I'm sure everybody in the room has at least one cell phone, as does this lady in uh, Delhi. I'm going to talk to you a, a few uh, I'm going to tell you a few facts about mobile adoption, that is the adoption of cellular, of mobile technology. And I'm going to talk about what's happening in both developing countries and uh, with the cell phone, the internet, and the, and the World Wide Web. And I'll talk about the differences in terminology between what I think of as the internet and the web. And why it is actually different in substantial ways from what is happening here. And, and why that matters, actually. Why that matters for folks like me who are trying to improve public health, why I think it matters for, or should matter, to anybody who's interested in the dissemination of information or the exchange of information, communication, et cetera. So let's talk about some interesting things about mobile adoption. It took about 20 years to sell the first billion cell phones. And uh, that, of course, that all, this all happened within our lifetime. And it took about four years to sell the second billion. And it took about two years to sell the third billion. So you can see where I'm going with this in terms of a world that has a population of, what is it, six or seven billion at this point? If you talk about the percentage of the world's population that is within range of a cell tower, for, for whom a cell phone is a possibility at least, back in 2000 it was 40% of the population, now it's about 80% of the population. Right? Think about the, the, the rapidity with which this technology is being taken up. Now, I do a lot of work in Africa, and in Africa, it's been particularly noticeable, I mean, particularly remarkable to see how people like this uh, Ethiopian shepherd uh, have taken up this technology. And importantly, this is, not, this is not a World Bank project. You know, this is not something that UNICEF has done. This is not 
uh, a USAID, a US Agency for International Development project or project of CDC. This is just companies out there, commercial companies, selling, selling technology and the poorest people in the world who everyone said before this could not afford any kind of technology like this and had to be given everything, that somehow they are actually able to go out and buy this stuff and are buying it in droves to drive the kind of adoption rates that we were, that we were looking at before. And I think it really teaches us a lesson about technology and about also about international aid because as it turns out, I think the big lesson from this is that um, if you give someone something that is useful and it is very apparently useful to them, then they will find a way by hook or by crook to get that technology and in fact don't need to be given that technology. Let's talk about the average growth in mobile subscribers and if, this is by continent so you can see the second column from the left is the Americas that includes both North and South America of course and the column all the way on the right is Africa and you can see this covers the period the 10 years from 94 to 2004 uh, all this stuff is from the International Telecommunications Union, whose website is quite, quite interesting to see in terms of these this sort of facts. But you can see that Africa actually has had a, a much higher, a much faster rate of mobile adoption year over year than any of the other continents. Now, of course, they're starting from a very, very low base of adoption, so it's not as if the same, you know, they're not even close to the percentage of the population having mobile phones that we are, but they are catching up and they're moving very quickly. If we look at cell versus landline adoption in Africa, the subscribers per 100 people, you can see that you know, the, the trajectories of these two lines, the mobile adoption versus landline adoption, is, of course, is quite dramatically different. And you know, there, are, there are lots of reasons why this is happening. Um, I'm sure many people in this room have traveled in developing countries. The thing is that uh, in most of these countries, the landline telephone services are government monopolies and they behave like government monopolies. Uh, they have high prices and they have poor service. And in addition, of course, it's much easier to set up and maintain a wireless system, building cell towers, et cetera, than it is to maintain a system where you have to have continuous wiring from one place to another. You can ask your, your cable company about that. Um, in addition, and this is particularly important for the developing world, cell phones don't require you to have a permanent address because you can do prepaid, you know. I'm sure everyone in this room has a cell phone and everyone in this room pays a bill at the end of the month. You use and then you pay for what you use. But everybody in Africa uh, has a cell phone where they pay in advance, they do prepaid. And of course that doesn't require a complicated billing system and it specifically doesn't require you to have an address, which means it opens up huge rural populations who can't meet those criteria, who have no credit of any kind. It opens up all those populations to the ability of having access to some aspect of modern telecommunications. So, as, so whereas uh, cell phone subscribers make up about roughly half of phone users in the, in the Americas, they make up about 75% of phone users in Africa, and, and again, more and more, a higher percentage as each year goes by. I would point out, of course, that you can see this is, uh, the units here are subscribers per 100 people, and in 2004, you were still talking only about eight subscribers per hundred people in Africa. So it's still a very, very low rate. But again, if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the slope of that line, you can see, you can imagine that how quickly they're gonna go from eight to 16, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is something that is wildly, wildly popular. 